no rain in the courtyard, right? Good. Good, good. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. We were discussing gravitational, started discussing gravitational production of spin three halves particles, Rarita Schwinger fields. And of course the starting point is the uh, equation of motion in curved space time. And, uh, equals zero. It is an equation. And, you know, the little underline on the gamma means you uh, absorb the space-time, curved space-time indices into Beerbein's, and this is the covariant derivative, etc. And this is a shorthand notation for some complicated series of sum of products of three gamma matrices. And just as in flat space, there are, as you write this, too many uh, degrees of freedom for psi. Um, so there's a redundancy in the description. So there's only going to be, uh, nu goes from zero to three, there's only going to be two independent uh, uh, spinners. And then um, we defined a new scalar field, psi. I guess it was 3 halves and 1 half times psi. And uh, ended up with a mode, and then the usual thing, expand in Fourier modes, and we ended up in then do the helicity projections into helicity three halves and helicity one half. And the helicity three half equation of state just looks like the, uh, the, the helicity three half equation looks just like the one for the spin one half. Looks just like the equation of motion for the, sp uh, the mode equation for the spin three halves, which in turn looks just like the mode equation in flat space except for the factor of A. Now the helicity one half equation of motion is more complicated. So far it's okay. There are these factors that come in CA and CB, and this, I believe, is where I stopped last time. Whatever, without ever writing down what CA and CB is, now I shall write them down. Or maybe I did write them down last time. Now, I'm going to include another term, which uh, for the Rarita Schwinger field will vanish, but I'll include it in general because for 
gravitinos, which is a spin three halves field, the mass of the field can change during evolution. So I'll just include it here and probably ignore it for the rest of the lecture, uh, but curious minds want to know. And it has to do with the uh, derivative of, with respect to eta of the mass. <coughs> R, of course, is the Ricci scalar. H is the expansion rate. And there's a similar expression for CB. Now, if I have written these things correctly in uh, flat space, CA will go to 1. That looks good. In flat space, in the normal case, this term is absent, and this term is absent. R and H is 0. There's 3M squared. That will cancel this 3M m to the fourth times M squared. So CA goes to 1. And CB, which is B proportional to H, will go to zero. So we recover uh, in flat space what we expect to recover. Good. Now, um, you know, expanding, we write the Now, just as in for the spin three halves, we're going to write the Fourier mode for K, both for, for the three halves and one half helicity states in terms of spinners, chi A and chi B, uh, times something that's going to carry the um, uh, spins. And the equation of motion for psi K I d eta, and, um, and this is for, for the three halves polarization because we've already, uh, the one half polarization because we've already done the three halves polarization. And again, this looks just like what we did for the spin one-half field, except the matrix A is going to be different. And again, this is for the one-half polarization. And again, if CB is 0 and CA is 1, we again recover the spin 1 half results. So we're going to go through the usual procedure is find the eigenvalues of A, construct the eigenvectors associated with those eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues of A are uh, plus or minus omega k, where omega k squared, which is an omega, omega k squared 
is C S squared K squared uh, plus A squared M squared. And C sub S is the sound speed. C S squared is the sound speed squared. And this is equal to CA squared plus CB squared. So unlike the case with spin one-half fermions, there is this extra factor here of CS squared. The sound speed will not be equal to 1 in the dispersion relation. All right, so we're going to follow the procedure. It's going to be a little bit more complicated, but follow the procedure that we did for spin one half. Um, we're going to diagonalize the matrix. We're going to express it in terms of the eigen in terms of the eigen functions. So, in order to do this, it's convenient to express a to the one half as a Hermitian matrix. It is a Hermitian matrix, <laughs> so we can express it as C S K E to the minus I zeta A M uh, C S K E to the plus I zeta minus A M. It is a Hermitian matrix. And here cosine of zeta is C A over C S. And cos and sine zeta is CB over CS. CS again is the sound speed, CA squared plus CB squared. And then we can uh, diagonalize this with a unitary transformation. Cosine of phi data divided by two. And again, you can see that if CS squared is, if CS is 1, then we recover the result we had before. Yes, thank you. Very good. Now we have, uh, just as in the spin one half case, we're going to, you know, do all the manipulations for you, and we're going to end up taking uh, partial derivatives of something that's u transpose u times that, and uh, we end up with a mode equation. or Dirac equation, if you will, chi plus and chi minus. And there's a term that involves the derivative of phi. This is familiar from the spin one half, but now we have this extra complication, and there's going to be another term.
So chi plus and chi minus are the eigenvectors, positive and negative frequency modes. If phi and zeta are time independent, then <clears throat> it's just the usual equation and the uh, solutions would be e to the plus or minus i omega, uh, i eta, i omega eta. But it's not. Um, so then we do the usual uh, quantization, bunch Davies, initial conditions, find alpha of k and beta of k. Um, again, you just follow your nose. We've done this several times before and most recently for spin one half. Okay, and then we can uh, go through and calculate n of k. And this is the result. This is the result of a numerical calculation of n of k. And I'll write it again. n of k is 1 over 2 pi squared k cubed beta of k squared. And this is important because the number density, n a cubed, is dk over k times n of k. So this shows the helicity three halves, which again is just the same as the Dirac fermion, the spin one half case. And um, in both these cases, it goes to zero as k goes to zero. So it is infrared safe. But you see the helicity, and let's just look at uh, when the m over h is one. The helicity one half is larger and it has all this noise, seeming noise, up here. It's not noise. I'll talk about the origin of that. So the helicity one half, uh, I'm sorry, for m over h of 1, it behaves more or less like you would expect. The helicity one half is larger than the helicity three halves. But for m over h of 10 to the minus 2, if the mass is smaller than h, it has an unexpected behavior, at least it was unexpected when I first calculated, the n of k continues to increase as a function of k. So why does a helicity one-half grow with large k? So we can form the adiabaticity parameter the same way that we formed it for spin zero and spin one half. And uh, the adiabaticity parameter, I'll write it, uh, let me not include the possibility that the gravitino ma that the uh, mass is changing with time. So this looks more or less like the, um, in fact, it does look like the result for the Dirac fermion, the spin one half, except for the CS squared. So here, if CS is one, then as K goes to infinity, it vanishes. But now, if the sound speed vanishes, a sub k doesn't vanish. Uh, a sub k would just be h over m. It goes to a constant. So in all the calculations done before, as uh, k 
in calculating n sub k for large values of k for k over m um, for k over a m large k over a e h e large it always decreases but it doesn't here if the sound speed vanishes so in the evolution if the sound speed vanishes the adiabaticity index does not vanish for large k so we can think of this just physically is if the sound speed vanishes, then omega k squared will be the same for any value of k. So to create the particles, there's no cost, no energy cost in creating particles with arbitrarily large k, arbitrarily large momentum, because the sound speed vanishes. <clears throat> so, you know, when we first calculated this, I expected, I did this calculation, I expected this to turn over and I kept running for larger and larger values of K and sort of said, uh, WTF, what's this feature? Why does it continue to grow with K? So now, have I erased C, A, and C, B? Yes. Well, that was dumb. If I form CA squared plus CB squared and calculate the sound speed, again, assuming that the mass is constant, So that is the sound speed. Good. Now, R, the Ricci scalar, is minus M2 times rho minus 3P. I did this in the first lecture. H squared. 3h squared is rho over m Planck squared. So I can write cs squared in terms of rho and p. And of course, at late time, um, it's going to go to one because the pressure and energy density will be smaller than that. At late time, uh, CS squared goes to one. So CS squared equal to zero when the pressure is minus 3m squared m Planck squared. And when this happens, it's going to depend upon the inflation model that you choose. Uh, this is the result for a quadratic model of inflation. So assuming that the inflation potential is just one half inflaton mass squared times the value of the inflaton field squared. <clears throat> so this shows the pressure 
and 3m squared m Planck squared, 3m squared m Planck squared is shown in the dotted line for various values of m over he. So you see if m over he is 1, the pressure never gets as large as 3m squared m Planck squared, so cs squared will never vanish. So if m over he is 1, the sound speed doesn't vanish, so at large k, it will decrease. If cs squared, I'm sorry, if um, the mass over he is 0.39 in this inflationary model, p will reach 3m squared m Planck squared once. So the sound speed will vanish once during the evolution. If uh, the uh, mass is smaller, say 0.01 compared to He, then it will touch, uh, it will cross zero many times in the evolution. This is due to the uh, oscillations in P due to the oscillations in the inflaton field. So the sound speed will vanish Say if m over he is 10 to the minus 2, that's why it increases. So this is a graph of how the sound speed vanish, uh, how the sound speed behaves as a function of the scale factor. A sub b e is the scale factor at the end of inflation uh, for various values of m over he. So if m over he is 1, the sound speed doesn't vanish. It does become smaller. And if the sound speed becomes smaller, the adiabaticity index is going to be larger, so you're going to produce more particles, but it won't be a runaway for large k. If m over he is 0.39, then it touches 0 once. If m over he is 10 to the minus 2, then the sound speed vanishes many times. And every time the sound speed vanishes, you will have a burst of creation of particles with arbitrarily large momentum. So if you have an, create an infinite number of particles, that doesn't seem to be a good thing to do, right? infinite number of particles with infinitely large momentum. So, to prevent catastrophic, I guess we should call it, particle, in fact, we did call it catastrophic particle creation. Catastrophic, that may be an approximation of how you spell catastrophic. Uh, particle creation. Uh, must have the sound speed positive, no, not greater than or equal to zero, but larger than zero. And in this quadratic inflation model, uh, the mass of the Rarita Schwinger field much, must be larger than 0.39 times H. And the expansion rate at the end of inflation is approximately the inflaton mass in the quadratic model. That's about um, 10 to the, it's about 10 to the 14 or 10 to the 15 GeV. Now, um, in the language of effective field theories, you would say, well, the Rarita Schwinger action is just an effective field theory. It's going to fail someplace for arbitrarily large energy. Perhaps you should put a cutoff of the Planck mass uh, because, you know, gravity will cut it off. You say the magic word, ma magic incantation, quantum gravity, quantum gravity, which cures all problems. Uh, you could also say the word asparagus, 
and it would have this asparagus, asparagus, you know, quantum gravity, asparagus, it has the same, uh, same meaning in this case. But uh, this brings up a question that I don't know the answer to, and perhaps someone will uh, weigh in on what this means. So the Rarita Schwinger theory is perfectly good in Minkowski space. It's, it's a healthy theory, propagates the correct number of degrees of freedom, the non-interacting Rarita Schwinger, um, the, the free Rarita Schwinger action. But now, in you could imagine a universe where the expansion rate is uh, smaller, is larger than H, I'm sorry, the, <laughs> the expansion rate is larger than the mass, and you would have catastrophic production during inflation. So the Rarita Schwinger action does not necessarily work uh, for any curved space background. What does that mean? I, I don't know. Is this sort of a swampland thing that it cannot be promoted to a uh, curved space? What do you think? I don't know what it means. Yes. Right, right. Yes. Ending inflation would be considered to be a, a bad environmental impact. So anyway, it's, uh, it's sort of an interesting thing to see. And we will see, for instance, for spin one and spin two, um, there are certain ways that would lead to problems in an FRW cosmology. For instance, the uh, spin zero, just for the scalar field, for the minimally coupled scalar field, if the mass is sufficiently small, you produce, uh, you produce the particles with uh, a logarithmic runaway at small k. You produce particles with uh, smaller and smaller k. So that seems to be a problem. All right, so I promised that Friday would be boson day, and now I'll talk about massive spin one fields. So we're going to leave fermions behind. When I was in graduate school, there was a professor in the department, Prigogine, is anybody, he got the Nobel Prize, but it was in chemistry, so it, it's not very important. Um, but when he taught, he would not erase the board. He had his graduate student sitting there, and whenever the board needed to be erased, he would call his student up to erase the board. It's, it's the second funniest thing I've ever seen in a talk. The funniest thing was when Brian Josephson gave a colloquium, and these were the days where the microphone had a wire on it, and the pointer that he used had a wire on it. And during his lecture, he got so tangled up in the two wires that he couldn't move, and he was trying to go back to erase the board, but he couldn't get to it. Because I thought he was gonna be strangled, so someone had to go up and disentangle him. Uh, uh, Josephson was, uh, maybe still is, I don't know whether he's still alive, sort of an odd character. The only thing I've done so far is knock the microphone off a couple of times, but that's not as bad as strangling myself with the microphone. So let's look at the massive spin one field. 
And uh, what action are we going to start with? It's sometimes called the PROCA action. I first learned about it, it was the De Bruyne PROCA action because I learned about it from a student of De Bruyne, Cecile DeWitt, uh, who um, De Bruyne was uh, PROCA's thesis advisor. So again, we're gonna, let's start in Minkowski space. Uh. So, so far this looks like the uh, Maxwell action. Now I want to add a mass and I can just add a mass in the following way. F mu nu is, of course, the usual field strength tensor. It's anti the anti-symmetric field strength tensor. Now, people are used to looking, thinking of spin one as gauge fields. This is not a gauge field. The mass term breaks gauge invariance. So this mass term is not a mass term. Uh, the usual invariance where you would have a mu go to a mu plus d mu lambda. Well, let's call it alpha. Uh, so this, and we're used to seeing um, gauge fields. Now we can view this as an effective low energy theory of an abelian Higgs model. This is the Stuckelberg trick. Let's see, I had Mr. Stuckelberg, uh, Mr. Stuckelberg. I guess it's Herr Professor Dr. Baron Ernst Karl Gerlach Stuckelberg, blah, 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 blah. So uh, again, the name tag at conferences must have been quite, you know, must have had a very large name tag at the conferences that he went to. So we could do an abelian Higgs model, introduce a complex scalar field phi, with a vacuum expectation value of V. And uh, the vector mass, M, would be G times V. So we can assume that the scalar mass Uh, proportional to V is much larger than G times V. So formally this is taking V go to infinity, uh, G go to zero, and G times V remaining a constant. So Stuckelberg in, I don't know, 1940s or 30s, discovered the abelian Higgs model, but he doesn't, didn't call it that. His work was uh, largely forgotten, but this known as the Stuckelberg trick, I don't know why it's called a trick, but it's a way to understand some low energy theory resulting from a higher uh, energy theory. So we just assume that the scalar mass, <coughs> you can assume that the scalar mass is large and we're integrating it out. It's not going to affect anything. So the equation of motion for the uh, Proca field
is modified from uh, electrodynamics. And uh, in terms of the field A, so just writing what this is, uh, again, in Minkowski space, it's A to alpha, beta, D alpha, uh, D beta, A mu. So here, you see that D nu of the equation of motion is equal to zero. So, so this implies that d nu a mu is equal to zero. So this is the familiar Lorentz gauge condition. There's no t there. In massless spin one, electrodynamics, the Lorentz gauge condition is imposed by hand. Um, it's not a gauge fixing term here. It, it follows from the um, equation of motion. Okay? So if I take d nu of the equation of motion here, um, Oh, I can just go up here. I guess this is the easiest thing to see. F mu nu is anti-symmetric. If I take d nu of this, this term vanishes, and I'll just end up with d nu a mu is equal to zero. Sorry? No, it's d nu a mu. because you have to take in this equation of motion d nu here, something symmetric multiplied by something anti-symmetric, so this term vanishes, leaving that. No? Sorry? Uh, the second term in what? In this equation of motion, this is a mu. Isn't that a nu? <laughs> uh, okay. Oh, the Lorentz gauge condition. Ah, oh, right, 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 right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I'm working in the approximation that mu is equal to nu. <laughs> OK. Now, let's think of degrees of freedom. Um, this is spin 1, so 2s plus 1. Spin 1 is equal to 3. So there is a, so a mu, you expect 4 degrees of freedom. So there is going to be a residual a um, du duplication of degrees of freedom. One of the one of the a mu's is not going to be dynamical. Oh, I'd also mention here that if you look at m equal to zero, take the limit of this theory as m go to zero, you do not recover electrodynamics. You recover Electrodynamics plus a scalar field. So taking m equal to zero, another degree of freedom, taking m equal to zero, this other degree of freedom survives. It decouples from a mu. So um, it's not going to go smoothly to electrodynamics as m goes to zero. We will see this in spin two, which I hope to talk about at least talk about a little bit after the break in 10 minutes and after the photograph, um, where the if you make a massive, if you introduce a mass to the graviton and take that mass 
going to zero, you do not smoothly recover general relativity. All right. So this won't be a surprise to anyone. Uh, F0, 0, 0 is equal to 0. So A sub T, the time component of T, is not going to have a kinetic term in the equation of motion. So this is the degree of freedom that we will integrate out of uh, the theory. We'll just solve for A sub T. Okay, so what would you do with the de Broglie Proker action in field theory? Yes. <laughs> About what, sorry? Ah, the degrees of freedom. So uh, if you just say, okay, I'm going to have a field. This looks like there are four degrees of freedom here, but we expect in the degrees of freedom for a massive field to have 2s plus 1, which is 3. So that tells you that not all of, the, of these a sub mu's are dynamically relevant. One of them is just not dynamical, and we can solve for that. So there's only going to be three degrees of freedom. So what are the steps? I'll just outline the steps without doing it. So we're going to expand the action in terms of a sub t and a sub i. expand A sub mu in Fourier modes, it's simpler to me to remove the redundant degrees of freedom, remove AT after expanding in terms of Fourier modes. So we're going to, let me put a little tilde over here to indicate the Fourier mode. And then, this is the usual decomposition. We're going to decompose the scalar, uh, uh, the spatial components of A, A sub K, in terms of transverse and longitudinal projections. So there will be two transverse degrees of freedom. Plus a longitudinal degree of freedom. Of course, the longitudinal degree of freedom uh, is absent in the massless theory. canonically normalize the transverse degrees of freedom is going to look, well, okay, it's going to be simple. We're going to canonically normalize uh, eight, both of them. Well, I guess the transverse degrees of freedom will automatically be canonically normalized. Canonically normalize the longitudinal degree of freedom, and we end up with something that looks like scalar fields of mass m 
we end up with three, something that looks like three scalar fields of mass M, two transverse, plus one longitudinal. So this, um, you know, we just, this is not unexpected. All right, now following the usual thing, we're going to write this in curved space and then take the FRW um, choice for the metric. And the algebra becomes a little bit complicated. So we're going to take eta mu nu to g mu nu. And f mu nu, luckily, is just going to be the usual. Uh, because when we take the covariant derivative, the Christoffel symbol is symmetric, and this is an anti-symmetric tensor, so it's just going to be the usual derivatives. Right. So it's just going to be g mu nu's up there, and a g mu nu instead of the eta mu nu. Now, we can also there's no reason not to add terms. We can add two of them. We can add a term like this, this non-minimal coupling to gravity, R is the Ricci scalar, and we could add a term These are both dimension four operators, dimension four terms, so in principle we should add them. Someone asked yesterday after the lecture, this is going back to uh, fermions, why didn't I add a term uh, that's something like r psi bar psi? It's because that is uh, dimension five. So for fermions, you, if we just restrict ourselves to dimension four terms, then we wouldn't add terms like that for a, fermi, for a fermion. Things will be messy enough, so I am going to assume minimal coupling. So squiggle one is equal to squiggle two is equal to zero. And it's almost 11 o'clock. Let me write, write the FRW action. And then um, we'll break for the photo and coffee. Of course, that's the anti-symmetric part. squared. As expected, there is no kinetic term for a sub t, so we can solve for it 
and uh, remove it from the action. So we're going to, when we come back, we'll, we'll expand the field in terms of the mode functions, expand A sub mu in terms of the mode functions, isolate A sub T in, from the mode functions, solve for it, remove it, and express things in the terms of conformal time. For the transverse component, it will be a canonically normalized kinetic term. For the longitudinal component, it will not be a canonically normalized kinetic term, and we would make it a canonically normalized kinetic term and uh, go through the usual thing that we've done before. All right, this might be a good time to stop, and uh, we'll all practice smiling for the photograph. So now the next step is to express the action in terms of conformal time using the orthonormal basis vectors for the transverse and longitudinal projections. And uh, the first thing you end up with is two copies for the transverse components. Uh, and it looks like uh, the equation for the for a minimally coupled scalar field. A minimally coupled scalar field that's conformally invariant. So there's no term involving the scalar curvature. And this shouldn't be that much of a surprise because the transverse components as m goes to zero should look like electrodynamics, which is conformally invariant. So I mentioned before that in the expansion of the universe, if, it's, if the action is conformally invariant for that matter field, you do not create particles. So you would not create photons in the expansion of the universe. So you would, uh, if the mass goes to zero, then you would not produce the, the transverse components of the spin one field. But if the mass is not zero, you would produce them. But we've already done this calculation. You, the result would be the same as for uh, the formally coupled scalar field. So I'll go no farther, no further with considering the transverse degrees. Now, the longitudinal degrees of freedom are somewhat more interesting. Uh, the data. It has a kind of, not yet a canonically normalized kinetic curve.
So we have to have a field redefinition, again, for the longitudinal component uh, in order to have a canonically normalized kinetic curve so we can do the usual quantization. And I'll mention that if I had kept terms that are the non-minimal terms for uh, the coupling to gravity, they would have entered here, and it would have the various values of C1 and C2 and the scalar curvature, this term would be negative. Ghosts are bad. I'm afraid of ghosts. Um, that would mean if it's a negative kinetic term, it would tell you that you could lower the energy of the system by creating more and more high momentum particles. Because the kinetic term would be negative. So ghosts. Um, Theories with, and these are not uh, the usual ghosts, the Fadeyev Popov ghost you get for uh, renormalization of gauge theories. This is actual, honest to God, real ghosts that would appear as physical particles, and uh, it would be a problem. So, was, again, this is something that, so what does this mean? You can have a massive spin one theory that's perfectly healthy in the Minkowski space, but certain couplings to gravity would make the theory pathological. What does that mean? Well, we just not worry about such deep questions and just ignore ghosts. And if I set uh, C1 and C2 equal to zero minimal coupling, then I don't have to worry about ghosts. So I would do a field redefinition that would lead to a canonical kinetic term for the longitudinal component. And uh, I'll just write what the dispersion relation would be for the longitudinal component. So far, so good. Now it becomes a little bit fun. This is a dispersion relation we have not encountered before. So it doesn't look like the dispersion relation either for any type of the scalar field theories that we, uh, that we studied. So it's a different dispersion relation, the different dispersion relation. And it has four terms. So let me now um, just so. And the usual thing. Um, you know, go through and create, and do the creation and annihilation operators, etc., and uh, calculate uh, beta k squared. In other words, calculate n sub k. And the evolution of the field will be different than uh, 
scalar field theory. And let me show that. Okay, I'm already screen sharing, so I should be able to go here. So this is the gravitational production of the broad Broca fields in an FRW background for a particular value of m over h. This is the spectral density, n sub k. So I've multiplied the transverse component here by a factor of 100. Uh, remember, for the conformally coupled scalar, this peaked around a few times 10 to the minus five or so, so I'll multiply this by a factor of 100. The longitudinal component is much larger than the transverse component. And you will also notice that although it is not conformally coupled, there are all these terms here, it is healthy in the infrared. If you remember the Minimally coupled, this is the minimally coupled field. The minimally coupled scalar field was logarithmically divergent in the infrared. So, what's going on? I won't go through all the details here, but there are four terms in the dispersion relation. And uh, this is, first of all, this is comparing the spin one, the broad polka for, polka for the longitudinal component, with spin zero that is conformally, that is minimally coupled. I'm sorry, that's conformally coupled. And uh, you see it has the usual behavior that we've seen before. It starts with the bunch Davies vacuum, and then grows during uh, inflation, continues to grow in the start of the matter-dominated era, reaches a maximum, and then decreases as a to the minus <coughs> two And we can understand this behavior for different values of k by looking at for what values of A do various terms in the dispersion relation dominate. So in, in region one, the k squared would be larger than all those terms. In region two, the other, uh, that the second term dominates. In region three, the third term dominates, etc. And in region four, <coughs> different terms dominate. And um, we know with the approximations that we had before that during the center, uh, A goes as 1 over 1 minus theta. And theta is negative, so A approximately theta to the minus 1, minus theta to the minus 1, equal inflation. And in a matter dominated term, era, A goes as A to square, the one half plus like what it is, A over A E. So this approximately goes as one over four A to square, as A becomes larger than uh, zero. So, I'll just show one thing that's uh, sort of interesting. At the large value of A in region 4, what does the solution to the equation look like? How do we understand all, that, all those oscillations there? Thank 
sufficiently large area or maybe k squared is just going to go to a squared m squared and uh, the mode equation just going to look like a sufficiently large A here U is M over A B what is the solution to that equation? some sort of vessel function Right? Because in order to differentiate your wave equation, it's always some sort of vessel function. And uh, I'll tell you what it is. That's the solution for chi's of k at large values of k. If mu a of q goes to zero, then chi's of k goes to a constant. Everyone remembers the small argument expansion of j to the one half, right? No, I, I never do, but Mathematica does. And if this becomes large, I'll just say much smaller at the moment, then chi uh, sub k goes as 1 over eta, mu to the one third, and then the cosine, it, it oscillates, right? Vessel functions always oscillate. There will be some damp oscillation. So for large O, oh, so I can convert this to eta, Eta squared goes like A. So chi k squared squared will go with 1 over a at large a. Once a, a over a e, is larger than mu to the minus 2 thirds. So once you reach this value, which becomes larger than 1, it's going to damp like 1 over a. So that explains the oscillation. So now we can calculate uh, omega h squared in the one in the longitudinal component, and we find something that's pretty interesting. And the result will depend upon whether there's early or late reheating. And early or late reheating will depend upon when reheating occurs. If reheating happens in this region, and we go to a radiation-dominated universe, this would be early reheating. If it happens 
in this region, and we go to a uh, late, uh, late repeating. Now, in this region, for alpha larger than mu to the minus two thirds, k smaller than alpha mu, this is non relativistic with h smaller than the mass, so we can define particles there. And then we can calculate the number density of particles. Right. So in the so I showed various regions where various terms here dominate how things scale with alpha. And it's different in, I won't show it to you, it's different in a radiation-dominated universe. In a radiation-dominated universe, R is equal to zero. And in a radiation-dominated universe, uh, A over AE would just be proportional to A, not A squared. So the solution of the equation would be different. So the final value of N that you, that you obtain will, be, will depend upon whether there's early reheating or late reheating. All right, so here I've shown as a function of the mass of the particle and the reheating temperature in the blue there is the values, the combination of the reheat temperature and the mass of the particle to give omega h squared of what? Of 0.12, which we expect. So each region there, depending upon h sub e, inside the region, omega h squared would be larger than 0.1. Outside the region, it would be smaller than 0.1 on this line. For late repeating and early repeating, omega h squared would be the correct value to be dark matter. So here, for the massive spin 1 field, looking at the longitudinal component, you see that you can actually, for a large expansion rate of the universe during inflation, you can produce the dark matter, which has a mass of 10 to the minus 15 or so GeV, about a micro electron volt. So before, for the scalar and the and the uh, and the fermion uh, components, assumption for the uh, uh, spectator field, in order to get the dark matter, we had to have the mass comparable to H of E. In this case, you can have the mass very light, you have axion-like particles. I don't know why anyone would want axion-like particles, but you could have them of 10 to the minus of a micro-electron mode, being the dark matter produced by gravitational particles. So if the, for late reheating, uh, omega h squared is going to be independent of the mass of the particle, going everywhere from h sub e, essentially, down to a, mic a micro-electron mode. And for early reheating, on this side, the mass will be independent of the reheat temperature. Uh, sorry, omega h squared of 1 independent of the reheat temperature. Now, to get a very low value of the mass, the microelectron mode, you have to have the reheat temperature rather low. So that's all I want to say about spin one. Now, with, this is not complicated enough for anyone. You want to see some more complication. I'll just talk for 10 minutes about massive spin two fields. So I'm going to erase the board and go to something more complicated. Any questions?
것처럼 There has been a lot of work on uh, something that's known as massive gravity, um, motivated by the observation of dark energy, or motivated by the observation of the accelerated expansion of the universe at late time. And people have wondered if you could muck around with general relativity rather than have dark energy, muck around with general relativity to explain the observation. One of the ways people have said is that maybe there's a very small mass of the graviton and gravitational strength is different at large distance scales. So there's been a lot of thought given to masses and to, uh, to massive gravity. So the place to start for massive spin two is the fierce poly. action for a massive spin two. And this was first developed by Gerritsen and Pauli. I don't have the year here, but it must have been in the 1930s, the 1930s or so, the Gerritsen Pauli. So what Gerritsen and Pauli did is look at metric perturbation. That will be the action for the perturbations about Minkowski space. So here to call it, assume that the background metric is Minkowski. And then they said, well, let's add a mass term. And there's two types of mass terms you can add. One, you might adding a mass term that's one half is called the M1 square H mu nu H mu nu. And you that to be bilinear in H, and you can also add a term that's one half M2 square 
later, H squared. So those are the two types of mass terms you can add. And Erickson probably looked at the following issue. If you have a massive spin two field, how many degrees of freedom do you expect? 2s plus 1, s is equal to 2, so you expect 5 degrees of freedom. If you add one of these terms, or maybe both of these terms, with arbitrary M1 and M2, you will find that you propagate 6 degrees of freedom. What could possibly be worse than propagating an extra degree of freedom? What could possibly be worse? Well, you can have something worse. Beards and Polly showed that for arbitrary combinations of M1 and M2, the extra degree of freedom that propagates is a ghost. So it leads to a sick theory. However, Beards and Polly showed that if you have M1 <coughs> equal to M2, You have five degrees of freedom propagating and no ghost. Now, M1 equal to M2 is not enforced by any symmetry. It's just enforced by the requirement that there are the correct number of propagating degrees of freedom uh, and no ghost. There's a couple of interesting features of this, of this mass of gravity. Uh, one interesting feature is you would think, now let's put these mass terms in to the einstein hilbert action. If you take the limit of the mass go to zero, general relativity. This may not be a surprise. Remember for spin one, for the mass of spin one field, as the mass went to zero, we recovered something that looked like electrodynamics plus an extra scalar field. As the mass goes to zero, this extra degree of freedom, so if the mass goes to zero, uh, this extra degree of freedom decouples but it's still present. So you do not recover general relativity. So general relativity is not the massless limit of a massive spin two field. That is uh, was something that I forget who, oh, who pointed this out. The, 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 Von Damme, Feldman, Zakharov pointed this out in the 1960s or something like that. Now there's also um, a whole talk about it, but it's going to decide that the Einstein. Where this, where Einstein pointed out that this extra degree of freedom has the, the uh, kinetic term is large, and you can add additional kinetic terms to it. And Einstein said, "Well, there's this extra degree of freedom, but the, uh, there's a mechanism for screening." the predictions, so you would end up with general relativity, for the most part. 
in some region. So anyway, that, that's just an aside. All right. So, so far, so good. But then, Olware and Deza, again in the 1960s or maybe the early 1970s, pointed out that um, the fierce poly reaction, putting M1 into M2 without removing the ghost, is only true in, and is not true. In higher order. So, in fact, if you go to a nonlinear problem, the nonlinear situation, you do have a ghost in general. So, for many years, it was thought that it would be impossible to produce a massive spin to. Consistent massless spin tube field theory. The massless spin tube field theory is GR. It was thought that there is no way to produce a massive spin tube field theory. Then it was another alphabet soup. This was resurrected by. found a way to construct a massive, a consistent ghost frame, massive gravity with the correct number of propagating degrees of freedom. And this was extended by By Hassan and Rachel Rosen to make a bimetric theory. So there are two metrics that G mu nu and F mu nu. So we want to add to normal massless general relativity, a massive spin to field uh, with the metric F mu nu. And as a prescription, we want to do this in such a way that it propagates the correct number of degrees of freedom and it goes free. So the Hassan Rosen action. mg squared over 2 on the square root of minus g, uh, Ricci scalar with the metric of g. So if you were satisfied just with general relativity, you would stop there. But now we're going to add another metric field. Two quant masses, Mg and Mf. Now I'm going to add a term coupled this, this metric field to some scale of field Lagrangian. So I'm going to introduce some field phi sub g. 
that stands for all the other fields you might have in nature, coupled between. And in order to have the massive, in order to have a ghost free theory, you have to have a certain coupling between F and G. And I'll just write what it is and say a few words about it. There's potential as a function of essentially the square root of the metric and uh, some coefficients beta. So it's not so easy to introduce, or not so straightforward, to introduce a massive spin 2 field without worrying about ghosts. And propagating the correct number of degrees of freedom. So m plus squared is mg squared plus m f squared. And this m star So there are two plug masses that you enter. You have an Einstein Hilbert act type action for the G, an Einstein Hilbert act type action for the F. You're going to couple the both metrics to some scale of fields phi G and phi F. Now the other thing I have to tell you is what is this potential, this interaction? First of all, what is this thing x? Uh, x, I won't write the indices because I won't get them right, is g times f. So x is sort of the square root. in the free action. Excuse me. I don't understand what you mean by the second metric. Sorry? Yeah. I don't understand what you mean by the second metric. It's a it's spin, spin two field. field. Okay. Uh, F mu nu is a spin two field that I'm calling a metric. Just as G mu nu is a described in quantum field theory a spin two field. Metric has some uh, property. Yep. This second metric has the same property. Yes, it will. That's the next step. Uh, metric of a, a manifold should be uh, So, we, okay. So let me answer this question. This is the next thing I'm going to do. So before doing that, I'm going to expand about some background. So I'm going to expand g mu nu with some background value of g mu nu plus uh, 2 over m plus square h mu nu. And one to expand f mu nu about some background. Uh, this would be m g square. H, uh, let's say K. Now I'm going to assume this is called a mirrored solution. That the backgrounds are the same. Okay, so this goes back to your question. I'm going to assume that the for the two metrics of the same. And sometimes it's called proportional background where the 
there's some constant here, but these constant can be reabsorbed into field redefinitions, so we can take gene nu to put a healthy And I'm also going to <coughs> expand phi sub g as a background value plus some perturbation, and phi sub f. as the background plus the perturbation, and the mirrored solutions here will not be phi g equal to phi f, but so I can find some single background field phi phi g, the background for phi g and phi f will be related to phi. So these combinations will play the role of the inputs on the This sort of f mu nu is going to play the role of the massive spectator field, and g mu nu is going to end up playing the role of the massless graviton. Yes? Those uh, choices that you make, or are they required by the, the mirror solution? Why, why choose a mirrored solution? Yeah, like I would choose to, I, I, are we free to choose this for something else, or are these required to buy these? Because what we're imagining is that uh, G and F get together to produce a background field, and the perturbations are evolving in this background field. Okay, so I'm almost out of time, and just let me tell you where I'm going. All right, so, so far you say, well, that's easy. That's not so complicated. But, putting that on size into what I'm erasing now, you will see that these fields are not mass eigenstates. So let's make it a little bit more complicated. There's going to be mass eigenstates. Uh, let's call it UG and UF that these are U uh, uh, that are So these are the mass eigenstates, and these are combinations of H, K, and this is another combination of H, an orthogonal combination of H and K, which are the mass eigenstates. And they'll be the same thing for phi G and phi F. Okay, so we have an action that's too messy to write down. We have a background field equation. We can go through and calculate uh, gravitational particle production. And so this isn't quite complete yet. Remember we had a complicated expression for omega of k squared for um, a massive spin one. A similar expression for omega of k squared for the massive spin two. Uh, if I, it is about 27 lines long. It's a mess. I'm convincing you not to work on massive spin two field theory. It is, my God, it becomes long and involved. And uh, this is not quite finished to see what that ends up with. Or is it finished? Let me see if I have.
have the preliminary results now. So that's sort of, I'll stop here because that's where the published research is stopped. We hope to figure to finish sometime uh, before the middle of next month to post a paper doing gravitational production of massive spin two. And this is something that I'm working on with Andrew Wall, who is a postdoc in Chicago, his student, C.N. Yang. Andrew is now a professor at Rice, C.N. Yang, with an undergraduate at Chicago, and Rachel Rosen, who is keeping us on the straight and narrow in massive spin two fields. All right, so I, start, I started out talking about gravitational particle production, spent a long time on spin zero because it's simpler and it captures many of the phenomena for higher spin field theories. Then I went to spin one half, spin three halves, spin one, and now spin two is being done. And if you're looking for a thesis, if you want to do spin three, good luck. <laughs> so uh, I hope this has illustrated some of the subtleties of GR, some of the subtleties of the Cleveland expansion, some of the subtleties of quantum field theory, and I like it because it's a playground that I can exercise uh, what I learned in graduate school about quantum field theory and GR. Learned in graduate school and then forgotten about uh, uh, GR and quantum field theory. And uh, I'll just tell you, you never know more physics than you do when you defend your thesis. After that, it's all downhill. You just try to remember what you forgot. Okay, thank you for your attention and your questions, and I'll see you this afternoon. She was, where was she before? She was at Columbia. Okay. She was at Columbia for a two-body. Yeah, you know, this is... Uh...